Good evening. On behalf of the faculty and staff at the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, welcome, and thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lector Finn J.D. John, Master Curator at the von Junst Library's Corvallis Branch. It is good to have you with us tonight. Tonight we will be reading Chapter 10 of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs the 1912 documentary of Mr. Burroughs' uncle, John Carter of Mars. But first, I have some exciting news to share about the von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds' main Dusseldorf branch. As you probably know, the amount of space available in the branch for visiting scholars is somewhat limited. Perhaps I should explain, for some of our newer listeners and those who have not yet successfully visited our library, that the von Junst Library bears little similarity to the libraries that many of us are familiar with today. When you hear the word library, chances are good that your mind runs to a little split-level suburban building, well-lighted, its floors covered with shelves no more than six feet tall, around which patrons are invited to roam freely and to paw the books unsupervised and which not only permit children to enter, but actually cater to them with special sections of the library set aside for them. Such libraries are an Obama, uh, that is to say, such libraries are an invention of the 20th century. In fact, they are an invention of an American millionaire and his assistants, Andrew Carnegie. Before Mr. Carnegie's more egalitarian vision of a library became the worldwide norm, a library was a dark and sacred place, consisting of a small and windowless reading room at the front and a great vaulted book hall behind, with the books shelved from floor to the twenty-four-foot ceiling and arranged in such a way that only the branch's head librarian might know where to find a particular title. Patrons would enter the reading room and request a particular title, and the librarian would nod and with a dusty smile disappear into the Stygian depths of the great book hall. A few minutes later he would reappear with the priceless volume which the patron would be allowed to read, perched on one of the hard wooden benches specially designed to be somewhat uncomfortable to discourage too much familiarity. Or, if he or she were one of the very special patrons, and the book not one of the very special books, he or she might be permitted to take the book out of the library for a day or two. And this is the kind of library that was common in 1840, when the Fonyunce Library was chartered. And this is the kind of library that you will find should you decide to visit us. Overall, this has served us well. Not a single volume has ever been abstracted from our collection, but, as you may have noticed, the Council of Prefects has recently concluded that it was time once again to make some concessions to the modern world. This, of course, is why the library now has an internet presence. One of the concessions to the changing tastes of our patrons that the Thirteen Prefects is now considering is an addition to the library. Of late, with the increased popularity of the works of the late Lector H. P. Lovecraft, there have been a number of visitors to our library who wish to use books from our collection as reference volumes for excursions into dreamland. As you can imagine, this poses problems, for the ebony benches and tables provided for visitors in the reading room are particularly ill-suited to the needs of a reclining dreamer. Therefore, at the last meeting of the prefects, it was decided to look into the addition of a dreaming room at the library. This will, of course, necessitate some expenses, both for construction and for equipment. Some of the prefects were leaning toward allowing opium to be used as an aid to the inducement of productive dreams. But Lector Steve Costigan argued forcefully against this, saying that any scholar who requires a drug to dream productively is either lazy or inept, and has no business in dreamland at all, and rather should get a job in a Studebaker factory like the one near his house, and leave dream work to wiser scholars. Lector Costigan's argument carried the day almost instantly, and the suggestion of providing opium smoking facilities was dropped on the spot. Plans are being drawn even as I speak, and I will have fresh news of the project tomorrow. But now it is time to continue our reading of Edgar Rice Burroughs' extraordinary account of the experiences of his uncle, John Carter, on the planet Mars. 
Let us begin. Chapter 10 Champion in Chief Early the next morning I was astir. Considerable freedom was allowed me, as Sola had informed me that so long as I did not attempt to leave the city I was free to go and come as I pleased. She had warned me, however, against venturing forth unarmed, as this city, like all other deserted metropolises of ancient Martian civilization, was peopled by the great white apes of my second day's adventure. In advising me that I must not leave the boundaries of the city, Sola had explained that Wula would prevent this anyway should I attempt it, and she warned me most urgently not to arouse his fierce nature by ignoring his warnings should I venture too close to forbidden territory. His nature was such, she said, that he would bring me back into the city dead or alive should I persist in opposing him. Preferably dead, she added. On this morning I had chosen a new street to explore when suddenly I found myself at the limits of the city. Before me were the low hills pierced by narrow and inviting ravines. I longed to explore the country before me, and like the pioneer stock from which I sprang, to view what the landscape beyond the encircling hills might disclose from the summits which shut out my view. It also occurred to me that this would prove an excellent opportunity to test the qualities of Wula. I was convinced that the brute loved me. I had seen more evidence of affection in him than any other Martian animal, man or beast, and I was sure that gratitude for the acts that had twice saved his life would more than outweigh his loyalty to the duty imposed upon him by cruel and loveless masters. As I approached the boundary line, Wula ran anxiously before me and thrust his body against my legs. His expression was pleading rather than ferocious, nor did he bear his great tusks or utter his fearful guttural warnings. Denied the friendship and companionship of any kind, I had developed considerable affection for Wula and Sola, for the normal earthly man must have some outlet for his natural affections, and so I decided upon an appeal to a like instinct in this great brute, sure that I would not be disappointed. I had never petted nor fondled him, but now I sat upon the ground, and putting my arms around his heavy neck, I stroked and coaxed him, talking in my newly acquired Martian tongue as I would have to my hound at home, as I would have talked to any other friend among the lower animals. His response to my manifestation of affection was remarkable to a degree. He stretched his great mouth to its full width, bearing the entire expanse of his upper rows of tusks, and wrinkling his snout until his great eyes were almost hidden by the folds of flesh. If you've ever seen a collie smile, you may have some idea of Wula's facial distortion. He threw himself upon his back and fairly wallowed at my feet, jumped up and sprang upon me, rolling me upon the ground with his great weight, then wriggling and squirming around like a playful puppy, presenting its back for the petting it craves. I could not resist the ludicrousness of the spectacle, and holding my sides, I rocked back and forth in the first laughter which had passed my lips in many days— the first, in fact, since the morning Powell had left camp when his horse, long unused, had precipitately and unexpectedly bucked him off head foremost into a pot of frijoles. My laughter frightened Wula. His antics ceased, and he crawled pitifully toward me, poking his ugly head far into my lap, and then I remembered what laughter signified on Mars. Torture, suffering, death. Quieting myself, I rubbed the poor fellow's head and back, talked to him for a few minutes, and then, in an authoritative tone, commanded him to follow me in a rising, started for the hills. There was no further question of authority between us. Wula was my devoted slave from that moment hence, and I was his only and undisputed master. My walk to the hills occupied but a few minutes, and I found nothing of particular interest to reward me. Numerous brilliantly colored and strangely formed wild flowers dotted the ravines, and from the summit of the first hill I saw still other hills stretching off toward the north and rising one range above another until lost in the mountains of quite respectable dimensions though I afterwards found that only a few peaks on all Mars exceed 4,000 feet in height, the suggestion of magnitude was merely relative. My morning's walk had been large with importance to me, for it had resulted in a perfect understanding with Wula, upon whom Tars Tarkas relied for my safe keeping. I now knew that while theoretically a prisoner, I was virtually free, and I hastened to regain the city limits before the defection of Wula could be discovered by his erstwhile masters. The adventure decided me never again to leave the limits of my prescribed stomping ground until I was ready to venture forth for good and all, as it would certainly result in a curtailment of my liberties, as well as the probable death of Wula, were we to be discovered. On regaining the plaza, I had my third glimpse of the captive girl. She was standing with her guards before the entrance to the audience chamber, and as I approached, she gave me one haughty glance and turned her back full upon me. 
The act was so womanly, so earthly womanly, that though it stung my pride, it also warmed my heart with a feeling of companionship. It was good to know that someone else on Mars besides myself had human instincts of a civilized order, even though the manifestation of them was so painful and mortifying. Had a green Martian woman desired to show dislike or contempt, she would in all likelihood have done it with a sword thrust or a movement of her trigger finger, but as their sentiments are mostly atrophied, it would have required a serious injury to have aroused such passion in them. Sola, let me add, was an exception. I never saw her perform a cruel or uncouth act, or fail in uniform kindliness of good nature. She was indeed, as her fellow Martian had said of her, an atavism, a dear and precious reversion to a former type of a loved and loving ancestor. Seeing that the prisoner seemed the center of attention, I halted to watch the proceedings. I had not long to wait, for presently Lorquas Potomal and his retinue of chieftains approaching the building and signing the guards to follow with the prisoner entered the audience chamber. Realizing that I was a somewhat favored character, and also convinced that these warriors did not know of my proficiency in their language, as I had pleaded with Sola to keep this a secret on the grounds that I did not wish to be forced to talk with the men until I had perfectly mastered the Martian tongue, I chanced an attempt to enter the audience chamber and listen to the proceedings. The council squatted upon the steps of the rostrum, while below them stood the prisoner and her two guards. I saw that one of the women was Sarkoha, and thus understood how she had been present at the hearing of the preceding day, the results of which she had reported to the occupants of our dormitory last night. Her attitude toward the captive was most harsh and brutal. When she held her, she sunk her rudimentary nails into the poor girl's flesh or twisted her arm in a most painful manner. When it was necessary to move from one spot to another, she either jerked her roughly or pushed her headlong before her. She seemed to be venting upon this poor defenseless creature all the hatred, cruelty, ferocity, and spite of her nine hundred years, backed by unguessable ages of fierce and brutal ancestors. The other woman was less cruel because she was entirely indifferent. If the prisoner were left to her alone, and fortunately she was at night, she would have received no harsh treatment, nor by the same token would she have received any attention at all. As Lorquas Ptomel raised his eyes to address the prisoner, they fell on me and he turned to Tars Tarkas with a word and a gesture of impatience. Tars Tarkas made some reply which I could not catch, which caused Lorquas Ptomel to smile, after which they paid no further heed to me. What is your name? asked Lorquas Ptomel, addressing the prisoner. Deja Thoris, daughter of Mars Kajak of Helium. And the nature of your expedition? he continued. It was a purely scientific research party sent out by my father's father, the Jeddak of Helium, to rechart the air currents and to take atmospheric density tests, replied the fair prisoner in a low, well-modulated voice. We were unprepared for battle, she continued, as we were on a peaceful mission, as our banners and the colors of our craft denoted. The work we were doing was as much in your interests as in ours, for you know full well that were it not for our labors and the fruits of our scientific operations, there would not be enough air or water on Mars to support a single human life. For ages we have maintained the air and water at practically the same point without an appreciable loss, and we have done this in the face of the brutal and ignorant interference of your green men. Why, oh why, will you not learn to live in amity with your fellows? Must you ever go down in the ages to your final extinction, but little above the plane of the dumb brutes that serve you? A people without written language, without art, without homes, without love, the victim of eons of the horrible community idea, owning everything in common, even to your women and children, has resulted in your owning nothing in common. You hate each other as you hate all else except yourselves. Come back to the ways of our common ancestors. Come back to the light of kindliness and fellowship. The way is open to you. You will find the hands of the red men stretched out to aid you. Together we may do still more to regenerate our dying planet. The granddaughter of the greatest and mightiest of the red Jeddox has asked you, will you come? Lorquas Potomal and the warriors sat looking silently and intently at the young woman for several moments after she had stopped speaking. What passed in their minds no man may know, but that they were moved I truly believe, and if one man high among them had been strong enough to rise above custom, that moment could have marked a new and mighty era for Mars. I saw Tars Tarkas rise to speak, and on his face was such an expression as I have never seen upon the countenance of a green Martian warrior. It bespoke an inward and mighty battle with self, with heredity, with age-old custom, and as he opened his mouth to speak, a look almost of benignity, of kindliness, momentarily lighted up his fierce and terrible countenance. What words of moments were to have fallen from his lips were never spoken, 
as just then a young warrior, evidently sensing the trend of thought among the older men, leaped down from the steps of the rostrum, and striking the frail captive a powerful blow across the face, which felled her to the floor, placed his foot upon her prostrate form, and turning toward the assembled council, broke into peals of horrid, mirthless laughter. For an instant I thought Tars Tarkas would strike him dead. Nor did the aspect of Lorquas Potomal augur any too favorably for the brute, but the mood passed, their old selves reasserted their ascendancy, and they smiled. It was portentous, however, that they did not laugh aloud, for the brute's act constituted a side-splitting witticism according to the ethics which rule green Martian humor. That I have taken moments to write down a part of what occurred as that blow fell does not signify that I remained inactive for any such length of time. I think I must have sensed something of what was coming, for I realize now that I was crouched as for a spring as I saw the blow aimed at her beautiful upturned pleading face, and ere the hand descended I was halfway across the hall. Scarcely had his hideous laugh rung out but once when I was upon him. The brute was twelve feet in height and armed to the teeth, but I believe I could have accounted for the entire roomful in the terrific intensity of my rage. Springing upward, I struck him full in the face as he turned at my warning cry, and then as he drew his short sword, I drew mine and sprang up again upon his breast, hooking one leg over the butt of his pistol and grasping one of his huge tusks with my left hand while I delivered blow after blow upon his enormous chest. He could not use his short sword to advantage, because I was too close to him, nor could he draw his pistol, which he attempted to do in direct opposition to Martian customs, which says that you may not fight a fellow warrior in private combat with any other than the weapon with which you are attacked. In fact, he could do nothing but make a wild and futile attempt to dislodge me. With all his immense bulk, he was little, if any, stronger than I, but it was the matter of a moment or two before he sank, bleeding and lifeless, to the floor. Deja Thoris had raised herself upon one elbow and was watching the battle with wide, staring eyes. When I had regained my feet, I raised her in my arms and bore her to one of the benches at the side of the room. Again, no Martian interfered with me, and tearing a piece of silk from my cape, I endeavored to staunch the flow of blood from her nostrils. I was soon successful, as her injuries amounted to little more than an ordinary nosebleed, and when she could speak, she placed her hand upon my arm and looking up into my eyes, and said, why did you do it, you who refused me even friendly recognition in the first hour of my peril? And now you risk your life and kill one of your companions for my sake? I cannot understand. What strange manner of man are you that you consort with the green men, though your form is that of my race, while your color is a little darker than that of the white ape? Tell me, are you human, or are you more than human? It is a strange tale, I replied, one that I so much doubt the credibility of myself that I fear to hope that others will believe it. Suffice it for the present that I am your friend, and so far as our captors will permit, your protector and your servant. Then you were a prisoner too? But why are those arms in the regalia of a Tharkian chieftain? What is your name? Where is your country? Yes, Deja Thoris, I too am a prisoner. My name is John Carter, and I claim Virginia, one of the United States of America. Earth is my home. But why I am permitted to wear arms I do not know, nor was I aware that my regalia was that of a chieftain. We were interrupted at this juncture by the approach of one of the warriors bearing arms, accoutrements, and ornaments, and in a flash one of her questions was answered and a puzzle cleared up for me. I saw that the body of my dead antagonist had been stripped, and I read in the menacing yet respectful attitude of the warrior who had brought me these trophies of the kill the same demeanor as that evinced by the other who had brought me my original equipment. And now, for the first time, I realized that my blow on the occasion of my first battle in the audience chamber had resulted in the death of my adversary. The reason for the whole attitude displayed toward me was now apparent. I had won my spurs, so to speak, and in the crude justice which always marks Martian dealings, and which, among other things, has caused me to call her the planet of paradoxes, I was accorded the honors due a conqueror, the trappings and the position of the man I had killed. In truth, I was a Martian chieftain, and this, I later learned, was the cause of my great freedom and my toleration in the audience chamber. As I had turned to receive the dead warrior's shattles, I had noticed that Tars Tarkas and several others had pushed forward toward us, and the eyes of the former rested upon me in a most quizzical manner. Finally, he addressed me. You speak the tongue of Barsoom quite readily for one who was deaf and dumb to us a few short days ago. When did you learn it, John Carter? You yourself are responsible, Tars Tarkas, I replied, in that you furnished me with an instructress of remarkable ability. I have to thank Sola for my learning. She has done well, he answered, 
but your education in other respects needs considerable polish. Do you know what your unprecedented temerity would have cost you had you failed to kill either of the two chieftains whose medal you now wear? I presume that one whom I failed to kill would have killed me, I answered, smiling. No, you are wrong. Only in the last extremity of self-defense would a Martian warrior kill a prisoner. We like to save them for other purposes. And his face bespoke possibilities that were not pleasant to dwell upon. But one thing can save you now, he continued. Should you, in recognition of your remarkable valor, ferocity, and prowess, be considered by Tal Hajus as worthy of his service, you may be taken into the community and become a full-fledged Tharkian. Until we reach the headquarters of Tal Hajus, it is the will of Lorquest Potomo that you will be accorded the respect that your acts have earned you. You will be treated by us as a Tharkian chieftain, but you must not forget that every chief who ranks you is responsible for your safe delivery to our mighty and most ferocious ruler. I am done. I hear you, Tars Tarkas, I answered. As you know, I am not of Barsoom, your ways are not my ways, and I can only act in the future as I have in the past, in accordance with the dictates of my conscience and guided by the standards of mine own people. If you will leave me alone, I will go in peace, but if not, let the individual Barsoomians with whom I must deal either respect my rights as a stranger among you, or take whatever consequences may befall. Of one thing let us be sure, whatever may be your ultimate intentions toward this unfortunate young woman, whoever would offer her injury or insult in the future must figure on making a full accounting to me. I understand that you belittle all sentiments of generosity and kindliness, but I do not, and I can convince your most doughty warrior that these characteristics are not incompatible with an ability to fight. Ordinarily I am not given to long speeches, nor ever before had I descended to bombast. But I had guessed at the keynote which would strike an answering chord in the breasts of the green Martians. Nor was I wrong, for my harangue evidently deeply impressed them, and their attitude toward me thereafter was still further respectful. Tars Tarkas himself seemed pleased with my reply, but his only comment was more or less enigmatical. And I think I know Tal Hajus, Jeddak of Thark. I now turned my attention to Deja Thoris, and assisting her to her feet, I turned with her toward the exit, ignoring her hovering guardian harpies as well as the inquiring glances of the chieftains. Was I not now a chieftain also? Well then, I would assume the responsibilities of one. They did not molest us, and so Deja Thoris, Princess of Helium, and John Carter, Gentleman of Virginia, followed by the faithful Wula, passed through utter silence from the audience chamber of Lorquas Potomol, Jed, among the Tharks of Barsoom. That's all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds with branches in Dusseldorf, Stregoikovar, and Corvallis. To learn more about our extra-temporal institution of forgotten learning, please turn to our hub page at von-junst.org, or if you prefer to visit in person, simply come to Dusseldorf on a clear moonless night. Rent or purchase a small skiff, and silently paddle north on the Rhine until you see the great stone tower rising from its eastern banks. Be sure to watch your step on the worn stone steps that lead up to the library from out of the depths of the Rhine, and if those steps are ever trembling, as from a hundred stamping feet, it would perhaps be best if you would choose a different night for your visit. Thank you once again, listeners, and good night. As all.